Welcome to Silicon Valley Buzz, the show where we discuss happenings in this, the most fertile spot on the planet for new ideas. I'm Seth Shostak, and the producer is Janet Wu. Well, tonight, venture capital and economic growth. What does it take to promote high-tech enterprise today, and how is the Silicon Valley doing? Are we slated to continue to be technology's shining star, or is the Silicon Valley destined to fade? Well, I have some guests who are going to fill us in on the economic future, the near-term economic future, particularly for high tech. They are Sarosh Kumana. Sarosh is uh, with the Technology Angel Investors of California, and he's also on the board of the Sand Hill Angels. Sarosh, welcome to Silicon Valley Buzz. Pleasure. Pleasure to, Pleasure to have you here. And also Don Ross, who's also a board director of the Sand Hill Angels and the co-founder of Health Tech Capital. And I'm sure, Don, you're going to tell us what that is. Yes, uh, thank you, Seth. It's good to have you here. And Tom Means making a return engagement here at Silicon Valley Buzz. He's an economist at San Jose State and also a member of the Mount View City Council. Correct, thanks. All right, well, look, gentlemen, let's get right to it. Uh, what is an angel investor? How does that differ from a venture capitalist? And why do we need angel investors? Maybe. Well, angel investors step in just after the friends and family and the entrepreneur put their own money into a startup. So this is the first outside money, typically the first outside money that a startup will get. Subsequently, a venture capitalist may step in if it's a successful idea, when more money is needed. It's, it's uh, kind of on a continuum when uh, funding starts, and then finally, if the company is very successful, eventually it goes IPO, and that's getting money from the public markets. Okay, so, so perhaps angel, you want to add something. But, yeah. but angel investors yeah. are the first investors, is that the deal? Typically seed stage, angel stage is the first money after friends and family. Right, so us usually there's an early friends and family round. A fundamental distinction between angel investors and venture capitalists is that angel investors are investing their personal funds and venture capitalists are investing from a fund that they've raised from uh, either institutions or uh, uh, from other investors. So they're, not, they're generally not investing their own money. Uh, and so that's a really <coughs> important distinction. The other thing is that when you start getting involvement in terms of helping out the company, sitting on boards, that sort of thing, is that usually angel investors tend to have more operating experience than a lot of the venture capital representatives. Uh, they come up through a different track into the industry. So, so you're like, uh, I don't know, Uncle Sidney, who steps in. I mean, you don't know him very well, but he steps in. He thinks you have a good idea. He's going to give you some money. And beyond that, Uncle Sidney has some real expertise in starting a business. Starting or running a business, yes. And, and so angels often do step in with advice, with mentoring, perhaps with uh, operational suggestions and so on. And, they, and the entrepreneur often depends on them, certainly in the early stages. Uh, how, how frequently do angel investors get involved? And, and, I mean, if you took the next 100 startups here in the Silicon Valley, what fraction of those would actually ever see an angel investor? So, uh, you know, an, an interesting comparison is, uh, uh, so, so particularly here in the Valley, probably most uh, uh, will be talking to angels at some level. Uh, and it really does become a stepping stone to venture capital. If you start just looking at dollars invested between angel investors and venture capital, it's really quite interesting. There's some data from the Angel Capital Association that shows that in 2009, the venture capital industry invested $17.69 billion. Angel investors invested $17.6 billion. Uh, almost equal. Uh, that's incredible considering that it's your money. It's your money. Right. I mean, that, that, that's a lot of money to put on the table. The, Venture capitalists, I've heard this, I don't know if it's true, but they expect that one in six, or something like that, of the, the uh, enterprises that they invest in is going to make it. The other five you know, are being paid by that one in six that made it. More like one in ten. Yeah. One in ten. <laughs> no, I've heard one in ten before when I've talked to people, and they just, that's why you have to kind of diversify, invest in a lot of them, because you know a lot of them are going to fail. Is, is it the same for angels? I mean, it's your money. You probably are more discriminating, aren't you? Uh, it can be a little bit of a different parameter. Uh, where So with a venture capitalist, they've got to get the mega home runs uh, to really pay off. They are also constrained by time. And so with that, they have to put a certain amount of money to work. So they really need to invest, say, $5 million and up on a deal uh, so that they're putting enough capital to work. So with that, there's a lot of really wonderful companies 
that you can have nice exits on that won't necessarily need that amount of funding in it. Uh, and those can be really a sweet spot for angel investments and uh, where the company can be entirely funded uh, by angel investors with no venture capital investment whatsoever. Right, and then so there's the other model where it's a stepping stone into venture capital. Right, so I think that you'll find that there's many more companies funded by angels than are funded by venture capitalists. So typically, uh, an angel round might be anywhere from say $250,000 to maybe $2 million, whereas a venture capitalist might start at about $2 million and go on till maybe 10 or 15 or $20 million. Uh, $2 million uh, would be, it's worth the paperwork for the venture capitalist to, to, to do it. Right. Uh, Tom, I mean, you must have some idea. How did this work 50 years ago when people start a business? There weren't angel investors. Well, you're right. They, they mentioned friends and family and things kind of start that way sometimes and people take their life savings. Uh, you go, you try banks, but financial institutions sometimes are more conservative as to what they'll loan money for and so forth. And so, you need some assets. So, in, you know, you think of the older days, entrepreneurship was mostly friends and family and so forth. And so, startups started small, and then you hopefully build up at that point. How dependent is Mountain View on this kind of entrepreneurial activity? Even even aside from who's funding it, you know, the economic activity in this city. What fraction of it is due to kind of small companies getting going? Well, you know, I don't have the exact numbers, but I think what I've tried in terms of, you know, on a council and land policy is to have small businesses, medium and large. So, you know, you know the history here. We've had a lot of high tech companies that started in small offices that have ballooned into large companies. And so for a land policy, you want to be flexible enough so that people can afford to start small, get medium. And again, you know, we have a lot of big companies, but they don't all stay because we only have so much land for that. So, so it's, today a big, it's, very impor it's very important, though, because you want that startup stuff. But, but today yeah. everybody's talking about job growth. That's a big right. thing, right? right. Yeah. So, so startups actually have accounted for virtually all the job growth that we've had in the United States for the last 30 years. So when you start looking at the actual numbers, larger companies typically shed workers, whereas startups expand the, the workforce. So it's really, really important as this has become more well understood, more and more countries, more and more states are putting together incentives for startups because they know that when you have a problem with unemployment or when you want to expand employment, you really need startups because they can rapidly ramp up. Okay, so uh, maybe you could give me some examples, if you know of any, of angel investor uh, begun businesses here in the valley that people may have heard of. I mean, you know, justify this activity for me. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, a, a company like Apple or a company like Google would be a typical example. There were certain uh, uh, far-sighted investors who wrote checks early on, and now, of course, they've been amply rewarded. And I think a lot of angels get into this game hoping that they're going to be the guy writing the right, check well, for, have, for, have, for the next have, one. Have and, 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 <laughs> and, and everyone always has their stories of the one that got away. And, right. and, 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 and actually, I uh, know well of a person who, unfortunately, has passed away who had the opportunity to purchase 10% of Apple and passed. Uh, but of course, at that point in time, there was no VisiCalc, so it was, what's this box going to do? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a good machine, but what can you use it for? Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, there's a lot of buzz in the news these days, of course, about the Facebook IPO. Now, did Mark Zuckerberg have an angel investor? Peter Thiel was <coughs> an angel investor. He put a half million dollars into it. So that's another yeah, example. Absolutely. We, yeah. we probably wouldn't have Facebook today if it weren't for that. If, if, or it would be existing in a very different form. What, what do you get yeah. for being an angel investor? Do you get shares? Do you just, just get an IOU? What do you get? Typically, it's either uh, a money that is loaned where the, the value of the company is not uh, determinate at that point in time, or you get a particular proportion of shares. You get a number of the shares. The loan is convertible into shares. Right. So fundamentally, you're looking for that you'll have part of the equity in the company, and there's different rights that are, uh, uh, are assigned to that. Uh, one of the interesting, I mean, coming back to the Facebook IPO, uh, it might be interesting to touch on is that the, uh, the closing down of, or the shrinking of the IPO market, which has been a uh, result of some of the uh, Sarbanes-Oxley and some, right. of the, uh, some of the requirements at the, at the federal level, then start shutting down some of these mega home runs that the venture capitalists are uh, counting on. And that's had some ripple effect in terms of dampening down the, uh, the availability of capital in the startup industry. Well, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. What is the environment like today? I mean, uh, I have a great idea. Can I get capital, can I get money from you guys as easily today 
as I could have before two, two, before 2008, or has everything you know shrunk way down? Well, I think that uh, as the capital markets have uh, slowed down, uh, the public markets, uh, it's made it more necessary to have angels. And also the size of the exit that an angel could look to get has also shrunk because the vast pools of capital that are available in the public markets are not now available. Typically, you have to look for a merger or acquisition for your exit rather than the public market. Yeah, and look, Sarbanes-Oxley will make you stay private longer. Well, maybe you should explain what Sarbanes-Oxley is. Well, they're, they're just the new requirements in terms of public. if you're a public company, well, you have to report and disclose. And so you look at Facebook, they've stayed private and internal. They've done some internal sharing and some redistribution, but you know none of that's transparent or clear because it's a private company now. So you, know, you have that issue now. Is, is that helping these firms be more transparent or less transparent? How could we, in fact, make it easier, or do we even so, want to make it easier for, for people with, with good ideas to get in touch with the money? Or is, it, or is it already okay, and the only question is, how many good ideas are there per year? So, good ideas get funded. I mean, that, that well, actually, let me back off of that. Good businesses get funded. So, it, it's, you know, back in 1999, when everything was going wild in the dot-com area, uh, PowerPoints could get funded, you know, ideas could get funded, back of napkins could get funded. Today, people really need to have uh, a much more developed uh, plan, idea, uh, business uh, to get funded, you, usually a more experienced team. Uh, but now is, uh, and in these times when it is a bit of a more uh, economic difficulties, there you will, is when a lot of the, the best startups emerge. It, how is the Silicon Valley, per se, doing. We think of Silicon Valley really as the nexus for high-tech innovation. But, you know, is that just history? We had a fortunate history that led to this technological development here. Could have been somewhere else. And so are we sort of like Paris Hilton, famous for being famous? Or is there some real <laughs> substance? Do we have something still to offer that, you know, trumps the next guy? Well, you know, Silicon Valley has had uh, a history and a reputation for being a good place for companies to start. And it has, it is that. However, uh, Silicon Valley and California, which used to fund 80% of startups in the United States maybe 10 or 12 years ago, now only funds less than 40%. And what that means is that other parts of the country and indeed other parts of the world have stepped up because they've realized the value of startups for job growth and as economic engines. And so they have been putting together uh, tax credits, uh, capital gains, exemptions, and all kinds of other programs in order to get startups in their area. And so, actually, California is falling back relative to the rest of the world. But, but does that matter, Sarosh? I mean, we may only have 40% of the startups, but maybe the total number of startups is going up, and all it means is that they're doing more startups uh, in the Boston area or Austin, Texas, or someplace like that. Maybe this isn't bad. Is it bad? It's not as good as it could be. In yeah, other words, what? What you have is you may have some job growth, but you're not having the kind of job growth that you would otherwise have had. And this is a very competitive world. And if we want to increase our employment stats, and I know that California lags the rest of the country, then we have to step up and do a lot more than we're doing right now. Tom, yeah. you're an I think, economist. Well, I think, yes, yeah, Sarosh is making a couple good points. He talked about job growth. And, and again, when you look at job growth, you're seeing the creation of jobs and the destruction. I'll use destruction, it's not in a negative sense, but companies that are large will start to cut back. People will transfer to those new jobs that are being created by startups. And so you want to have those startups because that's what's creating jobs, whereas the older companies, you know, it's like a capital thing. Countries that grow a lot, they tend to have lower marginal products on capital at some point. So they slow down and then new companies come in with higher growth rates and things like that. So. You need that process of, one, transferring labor from those jobs that are kind of being destroyed by the new technology and the new growth. It's sort of like what they're trying to do in Rochester. Kodak goes under, but you have all these technologically adept that, people that can start yeah. something else. Okay, maybe that works, but is it working? I mean, that's really my question. Well, is Silicon Valley hanging in there? I'm optimistic, but, you know, it's <laughs> like... It's hanging in there, but it's under attack, yeah. is I think probably the best way to put it. Uh, uh, Silicon Valley, I mean, certainly does have the, uh, uh, the history, uh, the name of the program, Silicon Valley Buzz. It still does ha definitely have the buzz if you talk anywhere else in the nation. It also has the ecosystem that uh, not only the 
uh, the entrepreneurs and the funding, but also the whole startup ecosystem of the attorneys, the accountants, that uh, different people that are wor working on deferring fees or they're used to the uh, the whole startup equity structure. Uh, but but we're not the only game in town any longer. Uh, both internationally and other places in the country uh, are seriously. It's like it's like having a any kind of a successful business. You have. Other businesses come along that want to take away market share from sure. you. Yeah. Right. As soon as they figured out what it took, and a lot of very smart people put their energy and attention into figuring it out, once they figured it out, they went ahead and created a situation where other countries, Israel, India, even China, a lot of these countries have put together programs like 100% uh, exemption from capital gains or tax credits for investors. All these things are cutting into the uh, possibilities that California has. So, Roach, so you, you've talked about yes. the tax situation for yeah. the kind of activity that you gentlemen are involved in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that uh, some, some alteration of that tax strategy might help to get more money going to more entrepreneurs. Maybe right. you could tell me something yeah, about so, that. Yeah, so for example, Wisconsin uh, started a tax credit program, and they found that over a five year period, the number of uh, startups and the amount of money that went into startups quadrupled and that is you know a large jump and I, I think that the amount of tax credit that they had was 30 or 40 percent it was not a huge tax credit okay so whereas other uh, states so Hawaii uh, for a while had a hundred percent tax credit for startups that were based in Hawaii so other countries are doing the same kind of thing other states are doing the same kind of thing and California is falling behind so, so you would advocate more of a tax credit for angel investment? Technology angel investing. So not for starting a, a fast food stand, but something that has the opportunity for creating lots of high paying jobs, which pay a lot more in taxes and property taxes, sales taxes, income taxes, and so on. It's an investment that will pay off for the people of California. And I really wish that the politicians that we have in Sacramento could see this, and instead of putting money someplace else, they invested with the smartest investors that they have, and that is the angel investors who are putting their own money up at stake and who have had a history of success going back decades. I, I assume you're advocating for this in Sacramento. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. But, but they may look at you and say, well, okay, that's good for you, but you know, uh, well, do you have yeah. credibility with these guys? Well. I think, uh, unfortunately, a, a lot of credibility uh, occurs with politicians when uh, you're able to help them out with uh, campaign finance. And I think that <laughs> that's, that's one of the variables that, uh, you know, we haven't, uh, you know, we don't compete with uh, a, lot, a lot of the other large special interests that have large uh, war chests to get, get their way in Sacramento. De devil you investing. Know, state, states yeah. compete, you know, just like countries <laughs> right. compete with economic freedom and things like that. We measure their index of that. States do that. And it does make a difference. I mean, you know, we are now seeing an outflow to some states because of their labor laws, because of their credits and things like that. I think the thing to be careful about is what you get in return. See, and he's, uh, Sarosh mentions technology, not fast food stores. Technology has one of those kind of positive externalities that it creates all kinds of other synergy for other companies to take advantage. And that's why it creates uh, a lot more value like that, as opposed to, you know, we're just going to make cars or something like that. But why don't we talk about a specific industry that I know, Don, you're in involved in, because one of the things in your title, health tech capital. You know, you're investing in uh, health care. Is it the, 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 the labor part of it? Is it the actual, you know, providing the service? Or is it in the technology of health care? What is it? Yeah, so, so as I think everyone knows now, as we're undergoing a big revolution in our healthcare system, uh, and with all of these disruptions that are going on, that you know, out of that becomes opportunities of new businesses. There's a lot of uh, uh, different uh, information silos that are being broken down, and so with health tech capital, we're specifically focused on the applications of inf information technologies to healthcare for the reduction of healthcare costs and the improvement of patient empowerment, the improvement of healthcare delivery. Can, can you so, give me a specific example of what you're talking about here? I mean, is it the, the, all those paper records at my doctor's office that you're trying to replace? So, for you know, example. So, so yeah. for, for yeah. example, one is the electronic medical records. Right. And so uh, particularly, there's a lot of the large companies are involved at the hospital level, but there's a, a small startup company that uh, is being widely known now called Practice Fusion that's providing uh, for electronic medical records at uh, physician office levels uh, for uh, independent uh, offices. And so, and their price point is very attractive, it's free. 
it's okay. So, yeah, uh, it's but, they, but they have a business model. It has a, free, uh, a, a premium that you um, upsell for it. It has advertising at the free level, and 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 they're they're really doing quite are well. Are you investing in firms uh, that give away their product? Yeah, right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually, we don't try to make it up in volume <laughs> if you're having losses. Yeah. But, uh, right. um, but the uh, uh, other kinds of examples, uh, there's. Uh, very concrete things that a lot of startup companies are going after with the changing rules that now for certain conditions, uh, once you're discharged from the hospital, if you're readmitted to the hospital within 30 days for that same uh, disorder, the hospital will now have to eat that expense. They can no longer get it reimbursed. That's a huge cost for the hospital. So they want, to they, they want you to come back no sooner than 31 days. Or uh, catheter uh, connections. Uh, catheter connections where right. a hospital acquired infections is another thing that is yeah. uh, to be what's called a never event. Uh, so this is a very simple device that has to do with capping off and disinfecting the uh, ends of catheters. Uh, it, it reduces infections and it reduces the cost for the hospital. Well, what, what fraction of the activity here is with devices as opposed to you know, sort of managing the business. Well, that, 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 so, the, that, yeah. so it's, it's really both. It's both workflows in the, in the hospital, or, and it can be devices, but the one thing is that we really focus on are things that have very low FDA requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, something that's very straightforward, uh, the FDA has become its own risk factor and, uh, and people really don't know where things are going there. So, uh, so uh, you know, actually when we started, we really looked to say no FDA requirements, but even now, and, and <laughs> there's, uh, there, there's true. going to be at least a low level from technology people think that it's uh, uh, really onerous, but I mean, even at a level of just the, you know, your software does what you say it's going to do. And so there's reasonable requirements there. So that, that let me give you another it. example. There's a company called PharmaSecure. And what it does is it authenticates uh, the uh, validity of a particular medicine. So this is a problem in many parts of the world. It's a big problem here in the United States as well, except that that fact is not extremely well known. However, there are even companies like McKesson who unwittingly uh, distribute medicines that are fake. And in third world countries, in India, in Africa, in Eastern Europe, and even in Europe, it is a gigantic problem. So this company, PharmaSecure, has come up with an easy, quick way to authenticate these medications at a consumer level and all along uh, the supply chain. And so they're going to be a very big company, and I'm sure, you know, so you know, Don knows about it, and I've invested in it, and I'm sure he has invested oh, in it. I hope you are Health investing in it. Uh, Health Tech Capital. I would support right. that investment. Listen, right. we only have a few more minutes, and I, I would like to talk a little bit about the competitive situation of the Silicon Valley vis-a-vis, yeah. -vis, uh, to begin with, I mean, there's the rest of the world, but even before the rest of the world, there's the rest of the United States. And we touched on that a little bit. But, you know, there are, are other states eating our lunch. Is that happening? Yep, that's exactly right. Other states are eating our lunch because we... California, the politicians in California are out to lunch. They are not even seeing this going on. And that is what we would love to see them uh, be aware of and then take action. The, the actions that are needed are not out there, difficult to do, they're easy to do. Other states are doing them successfully. They've proved it out. This is a business model that works. All that's needed is for someone to yeah. step up and say, I, we're going to do it. Sir, if Jerry Brown just appoints you tomorrow morning <laughs> as yes. high tech czar yeah. of the state of California, right what's the first thing you do? The first, <laughs> thing I'd, the, fir the first thing I'd do is I would institute a 30% tax credit for technology angel investing in California. The very first thing. And this, this, would, would I be glad that I'd seen you do that a year later? Absolutely. You would be glad. Jerry Brown would be glad. Uh, the voters of California would be glad because they'd be seeing additional revenues and they wouldn't have to be putting up more taxes, which is what the legislators are asking for now. Does this make sense? Yeah, at some level, because I think the problem <laughs> is... Because here's at the thing. some level. Here's the, no, here's the thing. W when you do that, you, you, you're going to run into political constraints of other groups that, that will fight against things like that and so forth. But you're right in the sense we do want capital flow here. You know. We, you know, the other group in uh, Silicon Valley Leadership's group, they come, they put a meeting on, and they all complain to the people from the United States government, the federal, the state, we have all this cash. It's sitting in another country. We're not bringing it in unless you do right. something and so forth. And that was a year ago. So here we are still trying yeah. to figure out how to get people to invest money in this country because, you know, th what people don't realize in terms of the economy is you can move things. The only thing that doesn't move is the land, basically. And so... All these things can move to areas where they're being taxed at lower rates. So you have to come up with a way of getting them to come back in. And that's yeah. where the, the federal government has failed. 
and the state government is doing it because they're too stuck on kind of this traditional way of seeing things and, and, and basically being led by special interest groups. You say the land doesn't now, move. I, I, I hate to tell you this, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're in California. But, but, okay, okay. In a technical sense, the world is spinning. But uh, I, what I'm saying is, is, is you know, you, you, taxes are like hot potatoes. You move them to the next area where they're not going to be taxed. And it's very easy to do that for some things. Well, what about the international situation? I mean, you know, we don't do a lot of manufacturing here. We accept that. The manufacturing, you know, you design something, you send a, a, an email to some plant right. in a part of China that you can't pronounce, and the product comes back. Right. We, we figure that's okay. Is technology going to go the same way? What's, what do we offer that the rest of the world can't? I'll give my own perspective. We still have the best universities in the country. Students come here to go to In the to country, school. but what about the world? Well, in the world, too. But I'm saying, we may not have the best K-12 through system, but students still come from all over the world to go to school here for the universities. So that means we still lead there. What about for how long? I don't know. Stay? You stayed. Well, I stayed, but my son, who's uh, in his mid-20s, has moved back, actually, to India to participate in the startup e uh, ecology over there. But where did he go to the university, and, and China, he, and China, China yeah. the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. And, but I'm saying people yeah. still yeah. come here for the yeah. best universities. And I may be, but China has uh, economic uh, incentives for, right. re for uh, returning Chinese nationals to uh, come back to China and start yeah. companies. I mean, there, there's... Yeah. There's definitely yeah. there, where, whereas people would come here and stay and start right, companies. Right. There's, there's right, much right. more of a. That's not yeah. I, I cycling think when I was in graduate school, back. all my foreign right. students, they weren't going back. Right. right. They knew where the opportunity. Now they would go back. But what I'm saying is the fact that we still have the best universities speaks well of this university system that it's competitive for research and technology. Uh, it but does how long does it go last for long funding? I, ho I hope <laughs> a long time, but you're right. It may not last forever, but that's... Gentlemen, I, you know. uh, alas, there, there's more to this topic than I thought. Uh, <laughs> it's been fantastic, Saroj, Don, Tom, to have the three of you here to discuss yeah. this. Uh, it sounds like, I mean, technology is the name of the game in the Silicon Valley, and it sounds like game on to me. I'm Seth Shostak, and I want to thank you very much for watching Silicon Valley Buzz. Be sure to join us next month.